Islamic mortgages and Islamic banking in their current forms are offensive to Islam. They are making a mockery of our religion by claiming products that are clearly riba based are in fact riba free. The folks at IFG have a different assessment. They've put together a video not too long ago explaining their position and answering arguments against Islamic mortgages. In this video, I'm going to review that video and give you my assessment of the arguments that they made. If you appreciate these types of videos, make sure to leave a like, subscribe for more content like it. And without further ado, let's get started. Assalamu alaikum folks. Islamic mortgages are one of the most divisive topics when it comes to Islamic finances. So we've decided to do an A to Z guide covering everything you need to know in one video. Over the last six months in particular, through IFG's investment arm, Curate Capital, we have actually started a fund that invests as an investor in Islamic mortgages. So I think it's good that Ibrahim reveals the possible conflict of interest that exists by revealing that IFG is actually investing in Islamic mortgages. So viewers should take that into consideration when watching their video. Now, this conflict of interest doesn't necessarily mean that IFG's take is bias on the matter of Islamic mortgages, but it does make it more likely, objectively speaking, it's more likely that there is a bias when there is a conflict of interest. Now, broadly speaking, there are three types of Islamic mortgages. Number one, murabaha based mortgages, two, musharaka based mortgages, and three, ijara based mortgages. The first type is a diminishing musharaka based Islamic mortgage. This is the standard Islamic mortgage. The way it works is there's a buyer, let's say you are the buyer for example, and in essence you're getting into a partnership with the bank or finance provider. So for example you put down a 20% deposit on the house, therefore you own 20% of the property and the bank pays the rest of the 80% and therefore they own the rest of it. And over time, you plan to buy them out slowly by paying them lump sums to own more and more of the house. And all the while, you also pay rent in proportion to the amount that the bank owns for you living in the house. This is because, of course, you don't own all of it. So it's only fair that you pay the rent on the portion that the bank owns. And every quarter, you are slowly increasing the amount of ownership that you have in the house and so that means that your monthly rent slowly goes down. The rent is how the bank makes money here. So like all Islamic mortgage proponents, the speaker is describing the relationship between buyer and bank as a partnership in the case of an Islamic mortgage. The problem with this is that a partnership implies sharing in the outcomes of a particular venture. However, the buyer in this arrangement is indebted to the bank with the price of the house regardless of anything. So there's no sharing in the outcome here. If the buyer doesn't pay the bank the price that was agreed to, they are in default. There is no partnership in outcome. Only in Islamic mortgages will you hear the indebted being described as a partner of the party they are indebted to. He then says it's only fair that the buyer pay rent to the bank because they don't own all the house. However, this just highlights an added element of unfairness in Islamic mortgages, which doesn't exist in traditional mortgages. You see, in a traditional mortgage, the buyer gains ownership of the house as soon as they accept the debt. So as soon as they become indebted with the price of the house, they're owners of that house the bank is listed as a lien holder. Only in banana land where Islamic mortgages exist, the buyer becomes indebted with the price of the house without gaining ownership of the house. Typically, when you don't live in banana land, if you become indebted with the price of something, you gain ownership of it. It's as if you already paid for it. If you go to your local convenience store, grab a few items and tell the owner, hey, put it on my tab and the owner agrees, these items become yours and you're indebted with their price. You're not partners with the convenience store and ownership of what you took. So no, it's actually not fair that the borrower pay rent. What's fair is that house ownership is transferred to the buyer the moment the buyer becomes indebted with the price of the house. Of course, the reason this transfer of ownership doesn't happen 
when the debt is established in Islamic mortgages, like it should in any other case. The reason why this ownership is not transferred is to allow the bank to claim that they are collecting rent and not interest. It's just meant to obscure the riba that is being charged. Murabaha based mortgages are the big other alternative. They're pretty simple. Here the bank will effectively buy the house of your choosing and will sell it to you at a markup. So for example, say the house you want is worth $300,000. The bank will buy it for you from whoever is selling it and then the bank will sell it to you for $375,000 over the next 25 years. And we're back in banana land. Instead of buying the property and selling it to the buyer, why not just lend the buyer the money they need to buy the house for themselves? Well, I'll tell you why. It's because doing it that way makes the loan too obvious. By buying the house and selling it to the buyer, Islamic mortgages can claim that they aren't in the lending business, they're in the property business. In reality, however, the service that the buyer is getting from the bank is control of the bank's money, that is a loan. Otherwise, the buyer wouldn't have approached the bank in the first place. After all, why buy the property from the bank for $375,000 when the original seller is offering it for $300,000 or pounds or whatever its price is. Why pay this premium? What is this premium compensation for? What service is justifying this premium? The answer is obvious. It's because the seller wants cash. The buyer doesn't want to shell out the cash, but the bank is willing to lend the buyer the money they need for the property, albeit indirectly. This is, in my assessment, a hila. It's a trick that's meant to deceive by changing the outward appearance of a loan and disguising it as a sale. So the benefit that you get is that you don't have to fork up that $375,000 and the benefit the bank gets is that they've got a bit of a margin on top of whatever the house was worth. In other words, the benefit you get is a loan from the bank and the benefit the bank gets is a bit of margin in return for their loan. If you think this is exactly like interest-bearing debt, you're close, but it's actually worse. You see, with interest-bearing debt, the debt bears interest with the passing of time. So going back to the example given, with an interest-bearing loan, if the borrower took out a 10-year loan for $300,000 to buy the house, for what it's actually worth. And the buyer comes onto an inheritance the next day, let's say, and he pays it off the next day. They'll pay very little interest on the loan that they took out because they only had it for one day. However, this is not what happens in banana land with an Islamic mortgage. In banana land, even if you pay off the $300,000 home you bought after a day or a month, you're still indebted with $375,000. I mean, how great is that? So the innovation they're bringing to the table, the Islamic mortgages that is, is that instead of the debt being interest bearing, it's actually interest guaranteed. So that regardless of how quickly the borrower pays back their loan, they are still indebted with the same amount of interest. So finishing off on Murabaha mortgages, again, they are seen as completely acceptable by Islamic finance scholars. And the way that it works is that the markup is basically seen as a profit that has been made by the bank. Well, I agree. It certainly is profit that has been made by the bank. But from what? What service did the bank provide which entitled it to these profits. I think it's clear that the service they provided was making available a loan and they're profiting from this loan. They're profiting from this service. This is RIBA, certain scholars approval notwithstanding. Jara based mortgages are similar to the interest only conventional mortgages that are available on the market. Here you pay rent on the portion of the house that the bank owns until eventually you either decide you're going to buy out the bank entirely or you decide to sell the property 
and everyone gets paid off however much they are owed. So again, to run you through an example, imagine you paid 20% deposit on a house and the bank pays 80%. Here, you aren't trying to buy the bank out in installments. So instead, you just keep paying that rent on that 80% that you're using until the time comes when you can either buy the bank out entirely or you sell your 20% onto the market and everyone exits the property. So actually this third type, I don't think it's used that often, but I have no problem with it as described. If you have the option and not the obligation to buy the remainder of the house, then you're not indebted and you're not a borrower. The rent you're paying in this case is actually rent because you're not indebted with the price of the house. Once you have the obligation to buy, you are a borrower and the bank is a lender, and the profit the bank earns in that case is RIBA. So as described, again, I'm okay with this agreement. I don't think it's used that often. I would have to take a closer look because often shaitan is in the details. There is another variant of the Ijara mortgage where the rental payments are actually increased such that you end up paying basically the value of the house through the rent. And in the end, the bank can transfer over the freehold title of the house to you in a separate agreement for a very nominal amount. All right, so we're back in banana land. Uh, so you're saying I get to pay for the price of the house without being an owner and the bank then decides whether or not to transfer the title to me at the end? I mean, <laughs> where do I sign up for this? This sounds like a great deal. I mean, I'm so glad these Islamic mortgages exist and not the uh, traditional unfair ones. Now you've heard all of that and you think, okay, Ibrahim, you make a pretty plausible case. It all kind of makes sense. But why are all these people who are so vehemently against Islamic mortgages saying what they're saying? Let's outline some of the common concerns that crop up with regard to Islamic mortgages. Firstly, people say they're too expensive. Secondly, they say the documentation and legal structure is basically the same as a conventional mortgage, so what's the difference? Thirdly, they say, why does an Islamic bank point to the base rate or Sonia? Aren't they just then basically using interest and calling it something else and selling it to us? Here are the reasons why we, in our humble opinion, don't think these are the real issues. I'm afraid Ibrahim missed the most important objection, which is that Islamic mortgages are fundamentally loans charging interest being disguised as something else, as I pointed out. This is the main objection, not the things mentioned. So I think he's straw man the objections to Islamic mortgages and is now going to attempt to defeat this straw man. Nevertheless, let's look at the arguments presented. Concern number one, they're too expensive. So I'm actually going to skip the response to this concern since this isn't a good argument to begin with. At least it's not a good argument to prove that these mortgages are not Islamic. They may be a good argument to prove that they're not a good product, but it has nothing to do with whether or not they are Islamic. It would be analogous to saying that modest fashion is not modest because it is more expensive. However, in my view, the fact that they are more expensive, given their disadvantages, which I've highlighted earlier, means, at least in my assessment, that the only reason anyone bothers with these mortgages in the first place is because they are marketed as an Islamic solution. Islamic mortgages don't just sell mortgages like traditional mortgages do. They also sell the word Islamic. And this is why they are able to charge higher prices, selling an inferior product, and still have customers. People are willing to pay a premium for products that make them feel better, even if they are objectively worse for them. And I think, unfortunately, Islamic mortgage companies are taking full advantage of this. Concern number two, Islamic mortgages and conventional mortgages look basically the same on paper. Actually, this is only partially true. As I pointed out, Islamic mortgages are objectively worse. They indebt the buyer with the price of the house without transferring ownership to the buyer in one case. And they guarantee the interest they collect without rewarding early payment in another. Some people have complained that Islamic bank contracts are nearly the same as a conventional mortgage contract and just the word interest has been replaced with profit rate. Actually, they call it rent more often than not. But when you compare the legal structures against each other, they are actually very different. In an Islamic mortgage, the buyer enters into a partnership agreement. 
with the bank and a rental agreement as well, along with a number of other supporting agreements. In a conventional mortgage, on the other hand, the primary agreement is that of the secured loan, along with various supporting agreements. The primary object involved in both approaches is to finance someone's purchase of a house and to provide the bank with sufficient protection for their loan slash investment. So I don't think the slash investment is appropriate here. It's either a loan or it's an investment. A loan grants the lender a contractual right to retrieve their principal. An investment doesn't. I think it's objectively true that these are loans. Let's ignore the slash investment in this case. I agree that it is a bit off-putting for the uninitiated that the same wording is being used, but it is actually very standard practice in the legal contract world to work off templates and past contracts. This is done for really simple reasons. If a past contract has been successful and perhaps even been scrutinized at court and withstood that scrutiny and everyone in the market understands it, then it is a good idea to model off that rather than write something entirely from scratch. While it's true that templates are often used when drafting legal agreements, the choice of template tells you a lot about what the agreement is about. Is it an interest-bearing loan? Then it's logical to use a template agreement for an interest-bearing loan. Is it an equity type partnership? Then you're not going to use the template for an interest bearing loan. Using a particular template, while it isn't a smoking gun per se, it isn't damning on its own, it should suggest something about the understanding of the contracting parties regarding what the agreement is actually about. Given the centuries of perfecting that have gone into the conventional mortgage contract, one can understand why Islamic bank lawyers borrow phraseology and templates from them. Yeah, I just think this is a bad excuse. The industry has been around for at least 10 years. It's actually been around for more than that. In all this time, no one could develop a different agreement. I mean, writing a legal contract is not rocket science. It shouldn't take this long to write a different contract. By this rate, humans will have colonized Mars and even colonized Pluto before Islamic mortgage is fully developed. I think that you may be able to get by with this excuse in year one, but by year 10, I don't think this is a good excuse anymore. Concern number three, Islamic banks peg their rates to Sonia or the base rate, and so they're just disguising interest. They aren't disguising interest because they're pegging it to some other rate. They're disguising it because they are lending money, charging interest, and calling it something else. However, let's continue to see their response here. SONIA stands for the Sterling Overnight Index Average, and it's the rate at which banks borrow from each other. So Islamic banks are operating in a regulatory system that is designed for conventional banks. Part of this regulatory framework stipulates that banks must advertise their products in a way that makes them comparable to other products on the market. So it makes sense for Islamic banks to do the same thing to avoid confusing their customers, regulators, and also the huge array of mortgage brokers they work with day to day who don't understand too much about Islamic banks in the first place. This does not mean that they are actually charging interest. Let me explain. If a juice shop sets up across the street from a pub and decides to price all of its juices in line with the price of beer across the road, is that juice permissible to buy? Of course it is. Just because the price of the juice is tracking the beer price does not make the product itself haram. When was the last time you saw juice tracking the price of beer? Technically, it's true that if it was, juice wouldn't become haram. But there is a reason why you've never seen the price of juice tracking the price of beer. They are fundamentally different products. Rarely will you see two fundamentally different products tracking the price of one another unless they are perfect substitutes. So like the contract terminology argument, the fact that Islamic and conventional mortgages are priced very similarly is not damning in and of itself, but it should cause the fair-minded person to pause and ask themselves, is this similar pricing telling me anything about the similarity in these products and perhaps the risk characteristics of these products? 
In the case of Islamic mortgages, I think it is. Now, whilst we're very supportive of Islamic mortgages, we do also recognize that they're not quite perfect. And here are three, we think, pretty valid concerns or arguments that people could have with Islamic mortgages. Firstly, Islamic mortgages don't share in the ownership risk adequately. Secondly, the contract itself does not use local rent values. It uses some kind of base rate equivalent. And thirdly, Islamic banks create money just like normal banks do, and that is bad for the economy. Let me unpick each of those points. So do they say unpick in the UK? In the US we say unpack. I've never heard unpick. I think it's high time that the British learn how to speak English from the Americans. Islamic banking is supposed to be a fundamental paradigm shift from lending to an individual where he is exposed to all of the risk of the venture and where the bank simply takes its fixed return to a setup when the bank is seen as much more of a partner in the venture and consequently shares in the risk associated with the house. However, three things seem to contradict this point. Firstly, Islamic mortgages, at least those that are available in the UK, ask the buyer to take out the house insurance on the house so that everyone is covered in the case of an alien ship deciding to land on the house, for example. Secondly, the Islamic bank also asks the customer to maintain the house and make sure its general upkeep is done, usually called a service agreement. Now, if the Islamic bank owned 80% of the house, say, then a common sense understanding of house ownership and partnership in a business would suggest that costs are split 80-20 when it comes to home insurance and upkeep. But that currently doesn't happen with most Islamic mortgages available in the UK. I have to say these first and second points are not good arguments against the existence of a true partnership. Partners can agree on whatever terms they find suitable. There is no requirement in Sharia that responsibilities need to be split in a certain way in a partnership. However, as I've explained earlier, for a true partnership to actually exist, there has to be a sharing in the outcome. But the other details are pretty much up to partners to decide. Thirdly, Islamic banks do not fully expose themselves to the vagaries of the open market. When you become a partner in a taxi, for example, and you both invest 50 quid each, let's say your partner gets you to promise you will buy his share off him at 50 quid in a year's time, regardless of the then value of the taxi. Given this locked in pricing, your partner is in effect not risking very much. He certainly isn't risking a loss. Good, we've actually reached the heart of the matter. Let's see what he says about it. In Islamic mortgages, this locked in pricing happens in the quarterly or six monthly or annual buyback of a stake in the house. The Islamic bank has already agreed with you from the start that the house will be sold to you bit by bit at the same price as that that you bought it at right at the start of your mortgage. This, in effect, helps you out because the house prices mostly rise. So if the bank was actually to work out the market price for its 80% share, you would end up paying a ton more over the period of the mortgage. So the point regarding the absence of a partnership doesn't really get addressed at all. Instead, it's argued that the setup is in the buyer's favor. Besides not addressing the issue at hand, the claim is just not true. The price that you buy the house at from the Islamic bank is above what the current market price is suggesting. Remember the example that Ibrahim gave earlier. The bank buys a $300,000 house, sells it for $375,000. The $75,000 extra is above what the market is pricing the house at. Houses often appreciate in price, but sometimes they don't, and the bank is removing this risk of the house not appreciating, removing it from their books and locking in their profit from the start. The bank in this respect is not helping out the buyer at all. It's placing the risk of the house's price on the buyer and securing for itself a right to profit or riba, regardless of what happens to the price of the house in the future. This is why they are not partners, they are lenders. But of course, sometimes, very rarely, things can go in the bank's favor. Let's say you wanna sell the house and the house price has actually fallen below what you bought it for. So let's say you bought it for 200,000 and you owe the bank 160,000. Unfortunately, the house is now only worth 150,000. Now in this situation, the Islamic bank can say to you, 
that if you really want to sell this property, then you need to pay us back entirely because we don't want to sell at a loss at this moment in time. So you can see it from a bank's perspective, to be honest, that if you're the one who's deciding to sell when you're in a loss making position, then that's kind of on you and they have their own investors to answer to. So if you do sell at that point, you shouldn't be putting them in a difficult position. This further proves that there is no partnership here. The bank really doesn't care what the heck happens on the buyer's end. They want their money back with increase regardless of anything. In fact, the interests of the bank may be directly opposed to the interests of the buyer. This is partly the reason why interest bank loans are prohibited in Islam. They pit the well-being of the lender against the well-being of the borrower. So in the case of the example that was mentioned where the borrower owes 160 on a house that is now worth 150, what is the borrower thinking? They're thinking they should probably walk away from their obligations. Why should they take the $10,000 loss? Let the bank take it. After all, they probably can afford to take that loss more than the buyer can. So this dynamic that Ibrahim is describing is one of the major reasons why Islam prohibits interest bearing debt and is further proof that this arrangement is nothing more than an interest bearing loan masquerading as a partnership. The Islamic mortgage uses Sonia pegged values to work out rent instead of trying to work out what the local rent would be for a particular property. This is not ideal. However, two important things have to be said in defense of this. Firstly, Islamic banks that did try to not peg things to the rate found that they were taking up precious time negotiating on rental rates unnecessarily with their customers. And given that they're not in the business of being an estate agent or a landlord, they really want to avoid this. Well, I think it's quite telling that Islamic banks claim to be charging rent, but are not really in the business of being a landlord. I'm going to make what I hope is an uncontroversial statement, which is that people who want to charge rent should be in the business of being a landlord. If you aren't a landlord, don't try to pass off the profits you're collecting as rent. We both know this is not the business that you're actually in. Our money supply, 97% of it, is created by private interest dealing banks who simply pop money into existence. Islamic banks, unfortunately, also operate in this system. This does mean that Islamic banks are also essentially creating money out of nothing. Suffice to say that fractional reserve banking screws up the economy, causes inflation, and puts money supply in the hands of an unelected elite group of private bankers. Now, UK Islamic banks who rely on savings accounts and current accounts also operate according to these practices. And this is another serious problem, in my view, with Islamic banking as it is today. If everything I've mentioned wasn't damning enough for these Islamic banks and Islamic mortgages. I think admitting that Islamic banks are engaged in fractional reserve banking should be the nail in the coffin. Fractional reserve banking doesn't happen when the bank is acting as a landlord. It doesn't happen when the bank is in the business of making investments. It happens when the bank is lending out more money than it has. It's pretty clear that Islamic mortgages are fundamentally haram in their current form. Now, the video continues with a rundown of the different options for Islamic mortgages. I'm not going to beat a dead horse here by pointing out the flaws in each one of them, although I think some are better than others. I think if you were listening carefully to the video thus far, you should be able to spot the problems with each of them by yourself. I've done my job by making the truth of the matter clear, everyone involved here needs to make a decision that benefits their Akhya. If you'd like me to propose a structure that is actually halal, I can do so. If I see enough requests for that, I will. If you enjoyed this video, you found it beneficial, leave a like, subscribe for more. And until next time, Assalamu Alaikum and peace be upon you all.